a young traveler's worst nightmare. Miles from home, no one knows where they are. The victims were from all over the world. These people were just vanishing off the face of the earth. We had no record, nobody noticed. Seven young backpackers were killed in two and a half years. I've got no doubt that he would kill a guy. They had little chance of escape. The isolation of this place is terrifying. It was one of the biggest murder investigations in Australian history, and the police didn't even know if they were looking for one killer or two. I was of the view that the facts suggested two people rather than one. Get out on the ground! This is the inside story of the investigation that shocked the world. The hunt for Australia's most notorious killer. Sydney, Australia, the starting point for thousands of young backpackers keen to explore and have fun. Nearly 100,000 backpackers come to Australia every year. They stay for weeks or months, most following the well-travelled East Coast routes. They start in Sydney. When they tire of the big city and the surf, they head north towards Cairns or south to Melbourne. We get backpackers from all over the world. All different nationalities and they seem to link up with each other and then they go off traveling they just get up from where they were and take off backpackers are drawn to the buzz of the cities and to australia's vast untouched wilderness some prefer hitchhiking to get around it's cheaper and they meet real australians but it isn't recommended hitchhiking is a risk a big risk, especially here in Australia, as your distances between A and B are so far, and that means that they are a long time on the road. And hitchhiking, they may be picked up by three or four different uh, motorists or truck drivers before they reach their destination. Not many people hitchhiked by 1992. In recent years, over a dozen young Australians and tourists had vanished from the highways. No one knew what had happened to them. British tourist Paul Onions thought he was worldly wise enough to spot any danger. At 26, he was older than most backpackers. He got to Liverpool, on the outskirts of Sydney, and planned to hitchhike a thousand kilometres to Melbourne on the Hume Highway. He'd already been trying for an hour without success and was on the point of giving up. G'day mate, how you going? Good, thanks. Waiting for a lift? Yeah mate, I'm going to Melbourne. Well, it's your lucky day, I'm heading that way. That's my four wheel drive, throw your stuff in. thought he'd finally struck lucky. It would take 14 hours to drive all the way to Melbourne. The journey began with small talk. So where are you from? I'm from, from Birmingham in the UK. What do you think of Australia so far? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Enjoying the weather. I'm uh, going to pull up when we get further up the road. We'll lose the radio signal when we get this far out of Sydney. I'll grab some tapes from the back so we can listen to some music, eh? those tapes. Where are you going? Just gonna get some air. We'll stay in the car, it'll only be a minute. You know what this is? Get back in the car! A passing motorist saved Paul's life by picking him up. The attack on Paul Onions happened just 400 metres from the turn-off to the Belanglo State Forest, a vast area of bush and eucalyptus trees. 
There, lying undiscovered, were the mutilated bodies of two other young travelers. The backpacker killer was on the loose. In 1992, no one knew a serial killer was on the loose in Australia. In September, two runners were training in Balanglo State Forest. A few meters from a track, they discovered a body. 30 meters away, another corpse was found. When police arrived at the scene, they were shocked at what they saw. The uh, excessive violence being used was horrifying, you know, like the, what must have went through those kids' mind before they were actually slain. The missing persons inquiry had gathered dental records of backpackers who had disappeared. Two records matched the bodies. They were 21-year-old Caroline Clark and 22-year-old Joanne Walters, British backpackers reported missing five months earlier. Joanne trained as a nanny and looked after children in Sydney for a couple of months. Joanne met Caroline in a backpacker's hostel in Sydney. The pair decided to team up and go fruit picking to help pay their way around Australia. When they hadn't heard from her for over a month, Joanne's parents came to Australia to look for their daughter. If Joanne hadn't been the person who rang us regularly, we wouldn't have been so worried. But after two weeks, we started to get worried straight away. We knew that Joanne was not a person who would wouldn't find some way of getting in touch with us. And I know she wasn't the type to, uh, she would have known we'd worried so much. In April 1992, Caroline and Joanne had left Sydney looking for a lift to Melbourne. G'day girls, how you going? Little lift? Their families never heard from them again. Caroline was shot in the head ten times. The police thought she'd been used as target practice. There were groups of wounds on the back of her head and on either side. Joanne died very differently. Holes in her shirt showed 14 stab wounds. She'd been stabbed four times in the chest, once in the neck, and nine times in the back. The stab wounds to her spine would have paralyzed her. Joanne's parents now knew where their daughter had been. They came down in the forest, and I took them into the forest uh, to do the uh, scene. And it's one of the most traumatic experience, you know, any police officer wants to do, or had to do, uh, because uh, they, they were visibly, you know, absolutely sh shattered, uh, standing there at the scene where their daughters had been taken away from them. They faced the cameras to appeal for information. We feel that Somebody out there might feel that there's, there's something else which is not important, but everything at this stage is important. And so all I want to say is I, that these people who have done these to, to these girls, that they are just proper army mans, and they ought to be shot. And I think it affects me the same way. I've got children, and uh, it certainly um, gave us more determination but the police had little to go on. They turned to a forensic psychiatrist. He analyzed the crime to suggest the kind of killer they were looking for. The forest gave him something to work on. It was the kind of area that 
one would expect uh, the macho kind of person who committed these crimes to frequent. Fairly rough sort of country, rough scrub, uh, difficult to find your way around in. I thought when I looked at it that it was someone who'd been there before and who knew it, that they felt secure in what they were doing, that they were in a hidden place, uh, they had total power over the victim, uh, that he, he could really do what he wanted. The offender would engage in hunting, um, might have a previous history of that, uh, of offences of some kind. The differences in the ways the girls had been murdered made Dr Milton think that there were two killers. It suggested that one uh, liked personal violence, close personal violence, and, and got some satisfaction from that. Uh, and it suggested that the other one uh, liked violence at a distance, uh, that is, exercising power in a more remote sort of way without making contact with the victim. The police needed solid evidence. The best hope was ballistics. Ten bullets were recovered from Caroline Clark's skull and in the soil where she was found. Ten Winchester cartridge cases were found a few metres from her body. Ballistics expert Gerard Dutton was called in to identify what kind of gun had been used. Now, by examining the various marks on the bullets and the cartridge cases, the, the size of the marks, their relationship to each other and so on, we can then refer to a, a manufacturer's specification list which gives us an idea of what type of firearm was possibly used. And, and after doing a lot of research in this area, I was quite happy that the only gun that I was aware of that could have left these marks was a Ruger Model 1022, which is a, a 22 caliber rifle with a self-loading or semi-automatic action. Knowing that the killer used a Ruger rifle was of limited help. There were 55,000 of them in Australia. We weren't aware of uh, exactly where all these rifles were. I mean, you can check with firearms dealers and who they sold this particular model through, etc. But that really massive job, and, and it was like searching for a, a needle in a haystack. The police found no other evidence where the bodies had been discovered. As the months went by and the investigators were, sort of went down um, chasing various leads, ultimately um, what happened was that these exhibits were filed in what we called our unsolved crime drawer. Um, and I was sure that this was going to be yet another double unsolved murder. No one realised Caroline and Joanne were just the latest victims of a serial killer. A year later, the police were no closer to solving the murder of the British girls. Bruce Pryor lived near Belanglo Forest. He often went there to collect firewood and knew it well. He remembered the story of the murdered British girls in the news. My interest is pricked by that to start with. And um, over the next sort of three or four weeks, you know, I'm sort of starting to think, well, you know, there's, no, there's very little more mention of it and what's happening. From then on, um, they sort of progressed from there. The story may have disappeared from the headlines, but Pryor couldn't get it out of his mind. He was sure the answer was still in Belanglo and decided to start his own search. I'd become a little bit obsessed with thinking I might find some evidence relating to the Clark and Walters murders. Pryor searched thousands of square metres of the forest, going to Belanglo every week for nine months. What he found one day in October 1993 was to shock Australia. One point I'm forcing my way through a bit of scrub and look down on the ground and there's a human skull upside down on the ground. And uh, that's when the little voice in my head goes, well, you've found something now, you're happy now. So it was quite, um, set me back a fair bit. I started thinking, well, what if today is the day that whoever's done this has decided to come back to shift the remains or just have a look or be here for whatever reason? That's when I decided, well, I can't hang about here and I've got to get this information to the police. So I wrapped the skull up in the jumper and hopped in the car and hightailed it out of here. Unknown to Bruce Pryor, 22 metres away lay another skeleton. Belanglo was a killing ground.
When news broke of more bodies found in the forest, hundreds of police and journalists rushed to the scene. A task force was put together to search for more bodies and investigate the murders. In charge was Superintendent Clive Small. I did wonder how many more bodies we would find and it was several weeks before I had any confidence that uh, we knew that answer. It was Australia's biggest ever search team, over 300 officers, but it was tiny compared to the vast scale of Belanglo State Forest. It stretches for 40 square kilometres. Inspector Bob May was in charge of the operation. It's been 13 years since I've been here, but the road is still as bad as it was then. It's very difficult. Uh, because of the, such a huge area, it would obviously be impossible to search it thoroughly. The bodies that were located were within 50 or 60 metres of a dirt track. So based on that, that's what caused our search to continue along those lines. If we went 30, 40, 50 metres in with 20 police on the line, depending on the country and the tracks in the area, that we hoped we'd find, if there were more bodies, we'd hope we'd find them. As the search began, the bodies were identified by dental records. Deborah Everest and James Gibson both grew up in Melbourne, but hadn't known each other long. In December 1989, they'd been in Sydney during their summer holidays. They'd planned to hitch to a festival 500 kilometres further south. James's mother had been worried about them hitchhiking. He said they'd be safe because they were travelling together. They'd been missing for four years. James Gibson's skeleton was marked with eight stab wounds. A large knife had cut through his upper spine, causing paralysis. Stab wounds to his back and chest would have punctured his heart and lungs. Deborah Everest had been savagely beaten, her skull fractured in two places, her jaw broken. There were knife marks on her forehead. She'd been stabbed once in the back. Her tights had been used to tie her up. The bodies had lain just 600 metres from where Caroline and Joanne had been discovered a year before. Police turned their attention to the man who had stumbled across the latest find. I was expecting, you know, a little pat on the back and, you know, job well done and um, suddenly I'm um, treated as a, a suspect and I found that very hard to deal with. While the police kept an eye on Bruce Pryor, they were given an unexpected clue. A man called Alex Milat told police he and a friend had seen two girls being abducted. Some months ago they had been in the Belanglo Forest. They had seen this car with a number of youths in it and they had a couple of people in the back who looked as they were tied up and were women. Now it was a very strange story. We did check the story and followed it through and as I said we're just not sure why they came forward with that story. It was also unusual that you'd see a, p a person saying that I thought these people were abducted in a car. They were being driven into the forest, but I don't know. I didn't bother reporting it or telling anyone. The statement didn't ring true, but it raised suspicions about Alex Malat. Detectives started investigating. Immediately striking about him was the size of the family he came from. There were 14 siblings. Alex Malat was the eldest of 10 brothers. The family had grown up together in a small house on rough land southwest of Sydney, a hundred kilometres from Belanglo Forest. They were known to be a tight-knit group with a tough reputation. Most of the boys had been in and out juvenile detention centres and jails. If one of them was caught, they'd take the full brunt of the law, whereas the others would get away with it. So they sort of, they were as thick as thieves, you could basically say, that they actually stuck together. The Milat family were now what the police called persons of interest. They weren't yet prime suspects for the four murders. The police hadn't finished looking for evidence in the forest. They didn't realise that they hadn't finished finding bodies. We came in 30, 40 metres this way and the line started to head east. I was at the front of the line. I just had a feeling because of the lay of the land and the, the roads in and the clearings and everything, this was a similar type of area that the other bodies were located so I asked the troops to just stop and concentrate and as I was actually speaking to him they called me to the end of the line and located a skeleton of Simone's middle just about where we are now. 
and she was covered up with uh, branches and all you could see was a boot. That was it. 21-year-old Simone Schmidl from Germany was outgoing and sporty. She'd been in Australia for four months before she vanished. She'd hitched to Melbourne once already and thought it was safe. Unlike the other victims, Simone was alone when she was abducted. She was driven for half an hour deep into the forest. She would have known there was no escape. Her bones showed eight stab wounds. There could have been many more. Two had severed her spine, leaving her helpless. Others had punctured her heart and lungs. The body count in the forest was now five. Two days later, the body count went up again. Clive Small announced what everyone had known for weeks. I think it's fair to say that given that we now have seven bodies recovered, and notwithstanding that we don't know the cause of death in the present case, that we do have a serial killer. The news of two more bodies went around the world. The murderer had earned a name, the Backpacker Killer. His victims were from three countries, the police hoped the media profile would give them a lucky break. Police in Australia has stepped up the hunt for a serial killer. From the very outset, we were hopeful that there were people who had got away from the offender or offenders, and that was one of the reasons we paid so much attention to the media coverage, both in Australia and overseas. 17,000 kilometres from Sydney, Paul Onions read about the case in a British newspaper. The bodies had been found close to where he was attacked four years earlier. Paul phoned the Australian hotline describing his attacker. Hello. Yeah, I'm calling about the backpack. Murders? Oh, yeah, I'd like to make a statement. It could have been the major breakthrough, but his statement was lost among the 5,000 calls made to the hotline in its first 24 hours. Thanks, bye. No one called Paul back the backpacker killer was no closer to being caught. By November 1993, Australian police knew that a serial killer had claimed seven victims. All were young backpackers whose remains were found in the Belanglo State Forest near Sydney. The latest discoveries were shocking. The violence had reached a new level. Twenty-year-old Anya Habshid had finished her studies and wanted to travel. She and her boyfriend, 21-year-old Gabor Neugebauer, left Germany in October 1991 to travel around Indonesia. Going to Australia was a spur-of-the-moment decision. They spent Christmas at a party on Bondi Beach. They were due home in late January 1992. Gabor was shot six times in the head. Anya's parents were told of how she died. The 20-year-old had been decapitated. Her neck had been severed with one blow. Her head was never found. No one knew if she watched her boyfriend being shot or whether he was alive when she was executed. This time, police used an anthropologist to analyze the murders. Once again, the very different methods used to kill Gabor and Anya suggested that there was more than one killer. The decapitation of Anya Habshid suggested to me the possibility, the likelihood of two perpetrators because I could imagine a dominant individual, the dominant individual, simply taking her hair and cutting her head off uh, and making some sort of laconic and ironic uh, kind of comment to this, to the effect of, well, that should shut her up. Uh, but also something which would be a statement of dominance over the other uh, individual.
It appeared Gabor had been used as shooting practice, just like Caroline Clark, the British girl, found over a year before. There were three bullet holes in the left of his skull, and three at the base. It looked like the same person was responsible, but investigators needed to prove the same gun had been used. By comparing the rifling marks on the bullets, ballistics expert Gerard Dutton could show whether one weapon had been used both times, but there was a problem. Unfortunately, the examination of the bullets from his skull was, was very disappointing because the, the decomposition that had occurred um, from his uh, um, rotting brain tissue had affected the surface of the bullets and that had destroyed all of the, uh, the marks, the rifling marks and the individual marks that we rely upon. All I could tell investigators at that point in time was that a 22 caliber firearm had been used, but that was all. So that was, that was quite disappointing. But bullets aren't the only things ballistics experts can analyze. After the gun is fired, the empty cartridge case is ejected. The cartridge case is scratched by the breech bolt when it leaves the gun. Successive cartridges fired through that same gun will generally leave identifiable marks and so the cartridge cases also provide a, a very good link back to the firearm responsible. 47 Winchester cartridge cases were found near Gabor Neugebauer's body. And I microscopically compared those to the ones that were found near Carolyn Clark's uh, body. Um, I was able to establish through the chamber marks that they'd been fired in the, in the same weapon. So now we had proof that the murder weapon had been used at two locations, and so that provided a definitive physical link. Both murders had been carried out using one of the 55,000 Ruger 1022s in Australia. As detectives traced each one, it was brought to Sydney Police Centre for testing. Gerard Dutton needed to see what marks were left on the fired cartridge cases. I was comparing them to the murder exhibits in, in order to see whether that gun was, was or was not responsible. Now that sort of work is um, very much hit and miss. To, to, to come across the murder weapon by chance is, is just um, is a very long shot. The exercise did have its benefits. And in the process over many, many months, I became very much aware of all of the, the features and the detail. It was like knowing the face of your own mother. You're that familiar that you'd, you'd recognise your mother anywhere. And so all of these marks on the cartridge cases and the bullets were the same. I knew if I came across the murder weapon and, and test fired it that I would recognise those marks instantly. But it could take months or years to find the killer this way. The pressure mounted on the police. The murderer could strike again. And a serial killer on the loose wasn't good for the tourist trade. There was a lot of media attention being given to is it safe for backpackers to come to New South Wales? Is it safe for them to travel through the state? That had a very big Im economic impact uh, for the state, and we had to be conscious of that. They needed to get a result quickly, but the investigation was swamped under one and a half million pieces of information. Among them was the statement from Paul Onions, the backpacker attacked on the highway near Belanglo. But there was no system for finding needles in haystacks. The biggest problem we had at the time was that the um, police information management system for major investigations um, wasn't geared to handling an inquiry of this size. Another challenge was narrowing down a list of possible suspects that contained 2,000 names. But many of the people we had nominated were uh, nominated on the basis of they're suspicious, they've passed a comment or something, but there was nothing to really link them to the crime scene or to suggest that they were a, a genuine suspect for any real purpose. It was the profiler's job to suggest what kind of person could be a genuine suspect. The forest gave them more clues. It reminded Dr. Basham of where he grew up in rural Georgia in the United States. It really struck me as the sort of scenes that I'd seen as a kid growing up, you know, where you go into a certain area which had been used as a shooting gallery. and. People had uh, propped uh, watermelons or they had, uh, you know, had uh, 
taken uh, trees and shot them, or even animals, in which animals had just been, you know, subjected to just massive uh, mutilation by bullet is simply part of target practice. In parts of Georgia, Dr. Basham knew this kind of behavior was often enjoyed by brothers who had a close relationship over many years. The solidarity, the kind of family society overrides the larger society. And I just had a feeling of, of the kinds of quality of the crime scenes that we might be dealing with that kind of family, that kind of person, a person raised in that kind of family. Dr. Milton agreed. The killer may have grown up with guns and may have gone shooting with members of his family. The family would be one which perhaps promoted um, violent acts or which didn't inhibit them, that there may have been other criminal behaviour in the family, uh, that they may be in some ways isolated from other families because of those tendencies. It was the kind of detailed analysis the police needed, and it reminded them of a family they had in their files. The Malat family were known to have firearms. Some of the brothers went shooting together. Some had criminal convictions. That's exactly the sort of family I've been talking about. That's exactly uh, the sort of uh, environment, social environment, that I would expect somebody who does this kind of thing to have grown up in. With the profiler's opinions, the police had to ask the question, could the killer come from the Malat family? And if so, which brother was it? They took a closer look at their backgrounds. Some of the brothers didn't raise suspicions and had no criminal convictions. Some would definitely need investigating. Richard Millat was fond of guns and sometimes used an alias. Wally Millat had been in and out of prison and owned some land the brothers used as a shooting range. Ivan Millat had convictions for theft and had faced an armed robbery charge. All the brothers were investigated. Paul Gordon, a detective on the task force, was given the job of finding out everything about Ivan. His criminal days seemed to be in the past. He lived in Eagle Vale, a suburb of southwest Sydney. Its commuter belt, the houses are modest, the gardens neat and tidy. Ivan Milat was a road worker. It was a steady job he'd had for 16 years. He'd be someone who, who would have a joke with you after work. He was a hard worker and always, always worked hard in all the positions that he's held. But generally, the consensus was that he was a friendly guy. G'day, Graham. How are you? Good, mate. How are you going? Good. All right. The neighbours knew him as a man who was always tending his garden or washing his car. All right. Yeah, good to see you. How's the family? Oh, pretty good. Yeah. He was someone who, if you needed something, you could go next door and get a cup of sugar. He was someone who, if the children were playing in the street and there was a car coming, he'd call out. Few of his neighbours knew that Ivan Malat spent most of the 60s in prison. Hi, Ivan. Morning, love. How are you going? Good. Good day for it, isn't it? Yeah. The police discovered Ivan loved guns, like his brothers. He had a powerful four-wheel drive. He'd had sporadic relationships, including with one of his brother's wives. And his ex-wife told police Ivan hadn't been as pleasant as the neighbours thought. What's this garbage? What's this garbage? Don't touch it! Leave it alone! That was your fault! You don't touch it until I tell you different! Although Ivan was known for keeping his house and garden neat and tidy, the smashed table was left on the floor for weeks. The picture that emerged of Ivan was an absolute control freak. And even in his personal life, uh, there were incidents uh, where it was not what I would call normal behaviour. It was about absolute controlling behaviour. It, it fitted very well with the profile of the first offender that I've described, that is, of someone who was employed, uh, had a fast car, was, uh, uh, had a previous criminal record, but who liked violence in a very measured and sadistic fashion. 
Detective Gordon believed the case against Ivan Malat was getting stronger. Gordon tracked down Ivan Malat's four-wheel drive. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, of course. Okay, when did you buy this? He car? had sold it. But the new owner had got more than he bargained for. He'd found a bullet under the front seat. The bullet was the same .22 caliber Winchester brand that had been used in the murders of Caroline Clark and Gabor Neugebauer. It didn't mean Ivan was the killer, and it didn't rule out one of his brothers. The police had to check their alibis against the abductions of the backpackers. We looked at the dates on which all of these people disappeared and checked the movements of the Malat family through a variety of ways, including work and all of that. And Ivan was the only person who was a, uh, unaccounted for on the day of each of the murders. But there was still doubt. Nothing in Ivan's criminal record suggested he was capable of something as serious as the Belanglo killings. Investigators went through every detail again. Buried in a 23-year-old file, they discovered a criminal charge that instantly made Ivan the prime suspect. When we went through and checked the criminal history of the Malat family, um, what was filed on archive records that wasn't readily available, we had to go back through um, hard copy searches, was the record that in about 1971, um, Ivan had been charged with abducting two women in the, in the Bowral area and had been charged with raping them. Ivan's defence had argued the girls had consented to sex. He wasn't convicted, but the case bore similarities to the murders. The girls had been picked up hitchhiking and Ivan had driven them off the highway and onto a dirt track. The circumstances of the rape and abduction charge um, did give you a lot to think about when you compared it with what happened um, in the 80s and 90s and the murders that occurred in the Blanglow Forest. Ivan Milat was now the focus of the investigation. Every piece of information had to be checked again. Detectives went back to Alex Milat to talk to him and his wife about the statement he'd given them. They were stunned at what they were told. It was quite unusual because, and strange because we had interviewed them several times. On this occasion, the investigators spent an hour or more or a couple of hours with them and were simply about to leave when Alex's wife and then Alex came out and said, oh, by the way, Ivan gave us this backpack. The backpack belonged to Simone Schmidl, the killer's third victim. No one knows why Alex Malat told police about it. It might well be that they just reached a point where they said, we think Ivan did it and we should hand this over. Whereas up to that point, it might well have been, they thought, no member of our family did this. We just don't know. Then came the breakthrough the police had been hoping for. They discovered that someone the killer had attacked was still alive. Five months after he'd called the hotline, Paul Onion's statement was found. The police realised the attack on Paul fitted everything they knew about their suspect. Paul could be the only person able to identify the backpacker killer. Oh yeah, this is Paul. Well, the backpacker killers. I, I made a statement months ago. We then had several contacts with him and arranged for British police to interview him. We were convinced that was, he was genuine, that he had quite a bit of detail to offer, and he was brought out to Australia, and he positively identified Ivan. The net was closing on Ivan Malad, but the police still couldn't be certain he was the killer, or if there was more than one. At 6.30 a.m. on the 22nd of May, 1994, armed police surrounded the home of Ivan Malat in a Sydney suburb. 
They were to arrest him for the attack on Paul Onions, but they also hoped to find belongings of the seven murdered backpackers and prove that he was the Belanglo serial killer. We made the best judgment call we could at the time. Uh, our view was that if nothing turned up, we would still be in a position to charge Ivan in relation to the abduction or shooting of Paul Onions. And from our point of view, that at least had him off the streets. Hello? It's Mr Ivan Manilat there. He's not here. Detective Sergeant Gorn is my name. I want you to come outside for your safety. And whoever's in the house with you. With Malat under arrest, the search for evidence began. We started finding property from the moment we opened the door to his house. To say we were surprised and somewhat stunned was to understate the situation. Uh, I certainly couldn't believe that we were finding the amount of property that we were finding. They found Simone Schmidl's tent, Deborah Everest's sleeping bag, and more camping equipment in the garage. The suspected backpacker killer was led away. The house was taken apart. They found firearms, ammunition, a large hunting knife, and a sword. Hidden in a wall cavity was a plastic bag. It was one of the most important finds, and Gerard Dutton was there when it was discovered. When the bag was opened, uh, you know, I couldn't have been more excited. In that bag was a complete breech bolt assembly, a uh, complete trigger assembly and an aftermarket magazine for a Ruger 10.22 rifle. The breech bolt held the key to the murders of Gabor Neugebauer and Caroline Clark. Knowing that, that the cartridge cases from the murder scenes contained some very good individual marks, that breech bolt was responsible for making those marks and I was very keen to um, examine that and um, to determine if that indeed was a component from the murder gun. Dutton fitted the breech bolt to a Ruger from the firearms library. It was the moment he'd been waiting for. Now he could compare the test-fired cartridges with those from the murder scenes. I felt all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. It was quite an extraordinary sensation because what I was looking at, uh, at on these test-fired cases, those individual marks which I was so familiar with on the Clark murder cases, I was now seeing on my test-fired cases. And so even in a short space of time, I was quite um, happy that that component that we recovered from the wall cavity of Malat's house was fitted to the murder gun that was used to kill Clark. The cartridge cases also matched those found near Gabor Neugebauer's body. In July 1996, Ivan Malat was convicted of the murder of all seven backpackers. Police believe he has killed more. There's no doubt in my mind that there are another three or four murders that he is responsible for. Um, there are reasonable grounds to suspect that. There is certainly not enough evidence to prosecute him. He has never confessed and no one will know for sure why he killed. I guess the only clue we've got really is that all these attacks appear to have occurred when he wasn't in a stable relationship. Now, by stable relationship, I mean a relationship where he was in control um, and once he lost that control in a relationship, I would suggest that he tried to find that control through other means and the other means were the abduction and killing of victims. I think the um, only good thing I can say about Ivan is that he will spend the rest of his life in jail and he'll die there. But that left one final mystery. Did Ivan Malat operate alone or was there a second killer? It's still possible that they have one perpetrator. But 
It seems to me that in terms of the separation of the bodies, the differential nature of the injuries, it seemed to me somewhat more likely that it would, would, would be two perpetrators. We've got two personalities at work, two different, different people at work here. Ivan's defense blamed his younger brothers Wally and Richard for the murders. The judge said that he thought it was inevitable that Ivan Malat did not act alone. Neither brother was ever charged. The police insist there was only one backpacker killer.